Welcome to Breaking Paradigms, a podcast where we talk about global perspectives on spatial planning in practice and theory, by Constance Frech and Sarah Kouchy. In this episode, we want to address vernacular structures and how they influence planning, architecture and the structure of the city. We will explore the definition of vernacular planning and take a look at the advantages and challenges of vernacular structures. To address these questions, we reached out to the Africa Innovation Network, who are currently conducting different initiatives, one of which is specifically targeting the topic of urban heritage on the African continent. We sat down with one of the managers of the initiative. My name is uh, Bushra Idrisi. I am an architect and urban planner from Morocco. During my own professional experience, I've worked on several projects related to restoration and rehabilitation of the architectural heritage in Morocco. I've uh, also been a mediator guide during heritage days in the same country. An experience uh, actually through which I've uh, discovered the genius of ancestral architecture and urban planning. Actually, I am a manager at the Africa Innovation Network, which is a young initiative that the purpose is to develop and implement uh, innovative solutions for the African continent. So the first part of our action is to communicate and develop new ideas. We have uh, developed, I think, till now five research themes, including Africa's architectural and urban heritage. Our aim, or this initiative specifically aim, is to put on the spot beauty, efficiency and effectiveness of previous architecture to show up, first of all, construction and rehabilitation techniques and discuss through examples, project, research, how the vernacular concepts can be readapted in modern architecture and space planning. I would like just to, to explain what does vernacular mean. In general, the word refers to domestic, native, and indigenous. Usually when we talk about vernacular, we do refer at the first time to a language, like the local language or dialect spoken by the ordinary people in a particular country or region. Then after, we started talking about vernacular architecture, which is architecture that, de that develops its own characteristic in a specific region when it often uses my local materials, way of doing things and traditional forms. A few years ago, when concepts like sustainable development, resilient territories appear, we have attributed the vernacular word to territorial and town planning. So coming back to your question, I think the vernacular planning is a, is a principle based on a thorough analysis of local characteristics that can be used in the management, for example, of energy, water or other resources. These features can be translated to potential map depicting, for instance, the opportunity to generate power from local resources. However, the concept of urban heritage is more common. We use it a lot than the vernacular planning and has two meanings. First, the urban heritage can refer to the list of heritage elements located in urban area. It does Uh, physically manifest through archaeological vestiges, historical buildings, vernacular architecture, historical gardens, even social practices, rituals, and festive. Secondly, urban heritage can refer to the city as a heritage, a special type of car culture, property that is mainly associated with neighborhoods, common centers, and historical cities. And this, this is what we try, like, um, to promote in uh, the Africa Innovation Network 
we try to work on the cultural aspect and in the same time the architectural and the space planning aspect, both of them. Because we believe that maybe the um, integration of population in the space planning is even more important than, than building itself. I would probably evocate the example of patio houses. It like houses, individual houses with a stanwell court. So this is a good example, I think, of a vernacular architecture, not only in Morocco, but also in uh, the whole cities of North Africa, like Algeria or Tunisia. And even sometimes we can find this type of uh, vernacular architecture in Spain. So this kind of architecture allowed the users to like take advantage through this uh, court like natural natural uh, ventilation and natural lighting so uh, they don't have to like to have uh, large windows on the exterior part of the house like on facades you can uh, take the advantages of natural lighting and uh, natural aeration just through this this central court and also this kind of construction does use local materials. Just here in Morocco, pastoral houses in the north of Morocco are not the same in the south of Morocco. For example, in the south, we do construct them with the uh, earth or adobe. In the north, we do construct them, we construct them with um, stones. So it's the not same thing. It's the same concept, but if you can see, it's just uh, by exploring the local materials and the local know-how. Yeah, just that all details, it makes difference. So I think uh, the vernacular concept in general, even uh, if we talk about architecture or planning, it meets the three pillars of sustainable development. From social point of view, this type of construction can enhance local skills, as I say, by training a qualified workforce. The space has been redesigned to boost social activities while being concerned with the life cycle of building from construction condition to use. Also, this concept fights against economic dependence, which is a really important point, through the development of local supply chains. Thanks to the local workforce and raw materials, and therefore to the rediscovery of development of know-how. The use of available resources, in fact, limits the transport of materials and labor, hence the reduction in the carbon impacts of construction sites. Notice the materials used are recyclable or biodegradable. The vernacular building therefore conceals through its uh, approach and its techniques, real lessons for designing urban environments more respectful to ecological balance. Also, the vernacular structure adapts uh, anyway as it goes along to the social environment and environment constraints facing in these societies. In a way, it is in perpetual renewal. Certain techniques have been per perfected over the centuries thanks to a detailed understanding of the territories, their resources, and uh, vital for sure human needs. Right there, it is the spirit and the thought process that have enabled the development and transfer of this know-how that must be found, not the techniques themselves, however ingenious they may be. The lessons brought by these vernacular construction methods deserve to be studied, selected, and uh, maybe reintegrated in today's project, but not in the same way. I would add uh, also that there, is, that there is a relevant approach behind the vernacular concept, which is local population inclusion in the space planning. And I think this is a very important point because today I noticed that in some cases we have the impression that we neglect the users, the human needs, and we just copy past trendy styles. So for me, this is the biggest advantage of vernacular concept that we should really highlight. Analyzing people's needs in a certain place and time to afford living and working environment affordable to communities. For example, you can check the city of Benguerir in Morocco. It is uh, an amazing territory of experimentation and incorporation of uh, vernacular concept in modern planning and uh, construction. It contains an eco village, a university, really amazing university, talking about the concept and in the architecture. Also, individual houses that respond perfectly to vernacular planning fundamentals.
I think that the um, development of um, vernacular buildings comes up a little bit against the urban rhythm. Far from the long and uh, progressive logic of rooting vernacular buildings, it is constrained by the lake of perspective and urban planning, as well as by the verticality of the construction in urban centers, for which this type of architecture brings few concrete applications. The absence of traditional buildings materials, such as raw earth, for example, added to the availability of raw materials in urban centers, increase the cost and complexity of projects. Added to this, there is the lake of uh, image of traditional materials wrongly associated with poverty and the fact that the local workforce is no longer trained for this type of construction. The practices and uh, even sometimes the methods of remuneration of construction uh, professionals favor short term logic of optimizing the cost of construction alone in relation to the lifespan of building. For example, in Morocco, or, and also uh, I know the example of Burkina Faso in Africa, the method of paying uh, masons in, uh, is an obstacle to the use of traditional materials in urban areas. The contracts are concluded on the basis of uh, an overall cost, which encourage the masons to favor materials such as concrete blocks, which are laid faster in order to increase their daily incomes. So I think that today we do more encourage people to go to like these newest, I can call them newest uh, materials such as concrete or steel, instead of encouraging them to like, uh, it's not get back, but to use and uh, develop the use of uh, ma basic materials that we can find in different territories. I would say at least, but not last, I think also that the vernacular practices are absent or timid in the major cases in planning policies. So for this reason, we as the future generation have the responsibility to think about our well-being in cities and countries in the future and therefore defending maybe our heritage. This is, uh, this is what maybe you um, evoke this, uh, this subject today, and I really thank you for this. Uh, we do also work on it in Africa Innovation Network, and we do evolve people to take part of these projects nowadays. Because I believe in things, maybe I'm going to say it to conclude this, that today's identity and tomorrow's innovation are based on the genius of the past. We didn't till now uh, innovate something or create something new. We just developed what does uh, what does exist or what does exist already. The way we build our cities, our towns, our places of business or community, and our homes inherently shapes our relationship with space. All over the world, we see how communities express their societal relationships in the built environment. Some communities might focus on communal spaces for interaction, while others focus on individual space. These practices have a profound impact on claiming and using space. Ali Sa'i, in his book Sustainable Vernacular Architecture, even goes as far as to claim that the global style of glass and steel high-rises fails to offer people a choice and forces residents to adapt their lifestyles to the built environment rather than the other way around. If you want to find out more about relationships between people and property, listen to our episode on the disadvantages of property. So what role can vernacular planning play? As Butra Idrissi mentioned, there are many lessons learned from vernacular architecture in terms of environmental and social challenges. However, often vernacular structures and urban heritage can be neglected and viewed as old-fashioned, impractical or inferior. The ubiquity of glass, steel and subsequent air conditioning in modern buildings, while more localized building forms go out of fashion, also brings up a taste of colonialism. 
or rather neocolonialism, as these materials were popularized mainly by British and US American developers. While locally sourced materials tend to get a bad rap for being, as mentioned before, inferior or less valuable. If you're interested in learning more about the influence of the glass facade, we recommend a TED Talk, which we will link, as always, in the description of this episode. Vernacular architecture and planning takes many different forms, like the Tulao in China, the half-timbered houses in Germany, adobe houses in South Africa, and many more. As we have traveled around the world, we have encountered many different types of local planning culture and architecture. However, we could categorize three general types of vernacular architecture. The teachers, the maintained, and the forward-looking. When researching the topic, you will encounter many different approaches, and most of them are case studies. And if you want to learn more about different local approaches, we recommend the 2014 book Lessons from Vernacular Architecture, which is a compendium of papers on different practices around the world, specifically focusing on the environmental advantages. Or the 2000 book Vernacular Architecture, both cited in the description. But let's look back at the categories. First, the teachers. This type encompasses all structures which are not actually utilized in everyday life. It includes all structures which are only available in museums or are unused ruins. Their main purpose is education and not inhabitable space. Secondly, the maintained. These are usually structures that are still used by people, but don't really live up to modern day standards of living and might not fulfill all the needs of its inhabitants. Often the inhabitants are elderly people, people with fewer economic means, or on the contrary, people who are specifically interested in maintaining old buildings. This might come from a personal interest or history with the building. Lastly, the forward looking. These incorporate vernacular structures while adapting them to current needs. They might be built fairly recently and incorporate local materials, knowledge and or patterns of vernacular originals. We are interested in your local realities. Are there any structures that come to mind around you? If you go to the episode page on our website, you will find a world map where you can add pictures of your local vernacular structures that you find interesting and maybe note down which category you would put them in. And let us know in the comments if there is a specific type of vernacular architecture we should take a closer look at. As always, we appreciate your comments and suggestions. And a big thank you to the Africa Innovation Network. Their focus on urban heritage and how it can shape our built environment is followed up with regular posts on Facebook and LinkedIn. You will find links to their social media in the description of the episode. They post regularly about different topics, including urban heritage, like the Tata houses, which have UNESCO World Heritage status. Check it out! And last but not least, this episode was supported by the HTU Wien and our wonderful patrons. Thank you for your support! This was Breaking Paradigms by Constanze Frech and Sarah Couchier. Be part of the conversation. If you like what we do, consider supporting us and join our Patreon community. Connect with us on Facebook, YouTube and at breakingparadigms.org. Content and editing by Constanze Frech and Sarah Couchier. Sound design by Didac Barroso and Florian Frech.